Thank you, everybody, for that kind welcome. And I'm glad you all got a chance to stand up, too. <laughs> I'm going to make sure this clicker works here. Yes. I am so glad Mark pointed that out, because I have to say that being a climate scientist in Texas is definitely interesting. <laughs> After we got married, my husband is from this area. He's from Northern Virginia, and I'm from Toronto. So fresh out of grad school, we were looking for a job, and he got a great offer at Notre Dame. So we were at Notre Dame for a number of years. But Notre Dame is actually a pretty small school, and so I didn't have a position there. I was commuting back and forth between University of Chicago and some other consulting things. So we said, well, you know, we really need a position together. Let's look for a place where we could both be at the same university. And it turned out the only university that had positions for both of us in exactly our fields was Texas Tech University. So by that point, I had realized that there were a lot of people who didn't think climate change is real, and I had also realized that many of those people live in Texas. <laughs> so moving to Texas, I was scared. I really was. I felt a little bit like one of those old-time Victorian missionaries back in the 1800s they were going to Africa, and they're not sure if they're going to be popped in the stew pot by the natives. Turned out, I didn't go for the stew pot option, I went for the other option. Within about two or three months of arriving, I got my first invitation to speak to a women's group about climate change. So I prepared my best effort, and I went in there, and I talked to them, and they had a ton of good questions. Questions that I didn't even know the answer to at that time. So I said, well, I don't know the answer, but I'll go find it. So I went back and I did, and then a few weeks later, I got another invitation to another woman's group from someone who had been there the first time. So I went with my new answers, and I got some more good questions, and it just kind of snowballed from there. So ironically, the fact that I'm standing before you here today is entirely a product of moving to Texas. <laughs> we have a problem today, though. And as a scientist, it's really a problem for us, because we scientists deal in data and facts. If you don't agree with someone as a scientist, what you do is you go out and you conduct an experiment, you collect your data, you analyze it, you publish it, you submit it to peer review, and then you say to the person you disagreed with, guess what, you're wrong. And the person you disagreed with, not always, but nine times out of 10 will say, oh, I guess so. That's the way science operates. Well, unfortunately, we've learned something the past few years. And what we've learned is that's not the way the real world operates, <laughs> is it? No. So that's why I want to talk today about how facts are not enough for what we are doing here. But because I am a scientist, I want to start with what we do know. What are the facts that we know? What is the solid foundation on which we stand? that gives us the confidence to go out and tell people, this is real, this is serious, we need to do something. Because what's the point of having a solution if we don't have a challenge? <coughs> so what do we know? What have we known since these really old dudes discovered it? <laughs> the foundation of climate science, and what I'm going to show you in this section here, is almost 200 years old. Did you know that? Climate science was not invented by Jim Hansen. Jim, are you here? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry to burst that bubble. There he is right there. <laughs> Although he certainly brought it to the fore in his testimony to Congress in 1988. What have we known for a really long time? We have known since the 1800s that when we burn coal, gas, and oil, it produces carbon dioxide. It's basic chemistry. We know that we've been burning a lot of this stuff. Anything that costs money gets written down, and so we've written down how much of this stuff we have bought, sold, and burnt ever since the 1800s. We know that our planet has this amazing natural blanket around it, and when we burn this stuff, it adds to that blanket. Now, I would say we know this, but it turns out there's actually one person who doesn't know this, and that will surprise you. I hate to say this, but the Pope's encyclical, which just came out, which is wonderful, is 99% correct on the science. It really is. Here's the 1% it's not correct on, is this. It's the fact that 
Carbon dioxide is important because of what we call the planet's greenhouse effect. So what happens? The sun's energy comes down, goes right through the atmosphere, right through all those little transparent heat-trapping gases, just like a window, hits the Earth, and the Earth warms up. Then what happens, and this is important, you can tell the Pope next time you meet him. <laughs> then what happens is the Earth heats up and gives off heat energy. And guess what? Those little gases that are totally transparent to the sun's energy are opaque to the Earth's heat energy. They absorb it like a sponge. So those natural heat-trapping gases keep our planet almost 60 degrees warmer than it would be otherwise. If it wasn't for this amazing natural blanket our planet has, we'd be a frozen ball of ice and we wouldn't be sitting here today. So why does this matter to what we're doing to our planet? Well, every time we produce more carbon dioxide, we're adding to these little black dots around our planet. And in fact, we have produced 43% more. So it's kind of like the story I tell is like my grandma. Whenever I used to stay at my grandma's house up in Canada, we did have central heating up in Canada. We didn't live in an igloo. But she was scared to death we'd freeze at night. So every night she would sneak in and we'd have a perfect blanket already. We'd be sleeping peacefully and grandma would sneak into our room and she'd put an extra blanket on us. And like clockwork, you would wake up about 3 in the morning sweating hot because grandma put the extra blanket on and you didn't need it. That's what we're doing to our planet. And that's why the Earth is warming. Now again, of course, from year to year and decade to get decade, the temperature goes up and down. There's no guarantee that next year will be warmer than the year before. But decade after decade, each decade has successfully been, successively been warmer than the one before, and our planet is warming. Now, here's something that many people don't know. And in fact, I was just on a call, let me take that off, I was just on a call with several TV meteorologists who are very well educated on weather and want to communicate climate to the television meteorologist community. I was on a call with them, and they said, well, we're asking meteorologists is none of the warming due to humans, is some of the warming due to humans, or is most of the warming due to humans? And I said to them, do you realize that according to the scientific literature, you don't actually have the right answer on that question? And they said, what are you talking about? I said, well, actually, according to the literature, these are independent studies, so each bar is a different scientific study asking what percentage of the warming over the past 50 to 65 years is human and what percentage is natural. So look at the human category, and I'll draw this handy black line here for you. How much, according to the scientific literature, how much of the warming is due to human activity? All or more than all. So the right answer wasn't even on the survey. Why is that? It's because according to natural factors right now, we should be cooling. According to orbital cycles, we should be on the long, slow slide to eventually end up in another ice age, but we have actually indefinitely postponed that ice age, as we'll see in a minute. And our sun's energy has been going down the last few decades, not up. We know also that the impacts are here today, and this is what was demonstrated so vividly in the years of living dangerously as well as so scientifically in the National Climate Assessment. I really feel almost like this is like the video version of the National Climate Assessment. It was so convenient that they did it at exactly the same time. They came out the same week. Isn't that amazing? And years, it has a second season coming. Yes. And lastly, we know that our carbon choices matter. We know that continuing to depend on fossil fuels will put us on an unprecedented trajectory for this planet, whereas making smart choices now will put us on a much safer, more tenable pathway into the future. This is what we know, and we've known this for a very long time. But there's a few new things we know today, too. And this is a great report by the American Association for the Advancement of Science called What We Know. They even have short videos to go with it if you don't want to read it. This is a fantastic short summary of what we know today. This just came out last year. So if you haven't seen this resource, it's a great short resource to kind of update you on the climate science. So what do we know that's new these days? Well, we know a lot of bad things. 
I'm sorry to say. We know that if you look at what the model said sea level was going to do, those are all the nice, smooth, colored lines at the bottom, we know that sea level is rising faster than the models predicted. We also know that Arctic sea ice is shrinking faster than the models predicted. The black is the real Arctic sea ice, and the colored, again, is all the models. We know that new feedbacks are emerging, or vicious cycles, as we should really call them, where as the planet warms, the planet responds. And in this instant, the planet responds by releasing more and more methane from the Arctic. Methane is a very potent heat-trapping gas. It traps more than 35 times more heat than carbon dioxide on a molecule-by-molecule -molecule basis. So we know that the planet is responding to and enhancing what we are doing to it. We know that if we look back in time, our carbon dioxide levels have exceeded any experienced during human civilization on this planet. And this is a really important point, because one of the common arguments people will say is that, oh, but it's been warmer before and carbon dioxide levels have been warmer before. And you can say, yes, there's a movie out now called Jurassic World. Would you like to go see it? <laughs> that is not the world I want to live in. The point is not whether this has ever happened to the Earth before. The point is it's never happened while we have been on this planet. And today we have 7 billion people living on this planet. Two-thirds of the world's biggest cities are within just a few feet of sea level. All of our land is already parceled up and allotted and packaged. What do you do if you can no longer grow crops on your family farm? A thousand years ago, you pick up and you move. What do you do now? What do you do if you can't live in the place where you used to live if it's underwater? A thousand years ago, you pick up your tent and you move. Today, your house is gone. The reason why we care about climate change is not because we've never seen a warmer world before. There were dinosaurs and it was warmer. It's because it's never happened while we have been here. And after the polar bear, we are the most vulnerable species on this planet. And that's why we care. We know, and this is the study I referred to earlier, we know that we have indefinitely delayed the possibility of the next ice age. And actually, that's, you know, we don't want another ice age, but we've gone so far in the other direction, and we're going further still. These are the choices that lie before us. Where on this red sliding line are we going to end up? That depends on our choices that we are making today. We also know that the warmer the world gets, one, two, three, four, or five degrees, the greater the risk of really bad things happening. And we know this. So us scientists have often been accused of being alarmists all the time. In fact, I have a great program director who's in charge of our, our program at Texas Tech, and He's on board with the idea that climate change is real. No problem with that. But the other day, he came up to me and said, you know, Catherine, he said, I think that people would be more accepting of what you, not meaning me personally, but what you climate scientists are saying, if you didn't exaggerate all the time. <laughs> he said, people really get tired of all those extreme messages. If you could just kind of scale it back and try not to be alarmist. So I said to him, well, unfortunately, that question has been examined by the scientific literature, this is the beauty of science, <laughs> to see if we really are conservative, if we really, if we really are alarmist. And, this, and actually, when you look at projections over the last 20 years, they found the opposite. They found that we have consistently, we scientists, have consistently been conservative. In other words, we have been underestimating the risks. And in fact, this paper concluded that scientists are systematically biased towards being cautious. Where they define caution, not as engineers do. How do engineers define caution and conservativeness? If you're building a bridge, what do you do? You look at the worst case scenario and then you multiply it by four or 10, depending on which engineer you're talking to. What do us climate scientists do? We look at the best scenario and we divide it in half, often. Yes, don't clap, that's not nice. <laughs> 
So this paper, the beauty of this paper is they said, we're going to actually coin a syndrome called erring on the side of least drama. Rather than being drama queens, we scientists, climate scientists are like anti-drama kings or something. We are, as a community, guilty of ESLD. <laughs> systematically underweighting the risk. And it's because we are afraid and we hate to be called alarmist. What else do we know now that we didn't know before? Well, we know that in the United States, doubt regarding whether global warming is serious, whether, or whether it's exaggerated, remains very high. It's not just in the US. I know we have a Canadian contingent here, right? Canadians? Yes, there we have a few. All right, I'm a member too. In Canada, things aren't looking so good either. If you look since 2007, the number of people who think the science is conclusive that global warming is happening due to human activity has gone down too in Canada. I'll give you a clue. Why do you think that is? When I was growing up, we had one American television station that you could get from Buffalo if your rabbit ears were pointed in the right direction. Today in Canada, we get all the American television stations and opinions have changed as a result. Here's the good news. If you're not familiar with the Yale Forum on Climate Communication, I suggest you check it out, because they have some really awesome maps. And the beauty of these maps, if you haven't seen them, is that they will give you these maps by congressional district. Yes. These maps just came out before I got a chance to speak to a number of Republican congressmen back a few months ago. So I made sure I had the congressional district version. As soon as I put these maps up, you could just see the laser focus right in their district. And then you could be like, you could see them all going, hmm. So these maps are awesome. And now you really have to check them out. I'm only going to show you a couple of the highlights as we go through. But first of all, what do we see here? Percentage of adults who think that global warming is happening. Now, just for reference here on all of these maps, any orange or red color is above 50, and any blue color is below 50. So what's happening? Across the country, everybody thinks it's real. This is good news for adaptation or climate preparedness. And that's a lot of the work I do. I do it with the city of DC, actually. I'm doing climate adaptation with the city of DC, as well as with Austin, San Antonio, and Boulder right now. But estimated percentage who think it's mostly humans. So this doesn't mean that they think humans don't have anything to do with it. They just wonder if it's mostly humans. And again, is it mostly humans? It's all humans. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> good news is, hey, I live in Texas. And you know what? Texas is looking pretty good. Why is Texas looking so good? It's close to the Mexican border. What's happening over the Mexican border? Chihuahua is turning into even more of a desert than it already was. Again, sadly, Canada is a little different. We don't have these cool maps for Canada, but where do you stand on climate change? About 54% say it's occurring partially due to human activity and partially due to natural climate variability. 32% saying human activity, 9% saying natural. And again, in the US, you can see those numbers, too. So it's really not that different anymore. It used to be, and it isn't. If we look at other social science work, we see that less people are worried now. This is the climate change threat index. People's perspective on how worried we are has gone down while the threat has gone up. Isn't that crazy? And media coverage peaked, but has mostly gone down and stayed stable. Although hopefully with the Pope's encyclicals, we have another peak around this time. <laughs> so all of this, you know, the scientists have underestimated it. The impacts are worse than we thought. Our carbon emissions are growing every year. But then people's opinions are going down, and people don't think it's a threat anymore. What's going on? This is the question I've been asking myself for the last five years. And let me tell you what I've found. We scientists and educators, and often maybe just regular people too, we often have a very pervasive and dangerous myth. The myth is this. The people are a blank slate waiting to be written on. 
That is the myth that we have. This myth is an official title. The official title is the Literacy or Knowledge Deficit Model. This is what it's called in education. This myth states, this model I should say states, that the public is willing and available to process information as long as it's available. So if people don't support something like climate change, it's just because they haven't gotten enough information yet. Now, I hear a few people laughing, but I get this every day. One of my colleagues just emailed last week and said, I know what to do in Texas. We build a website that answers common objections to climate change. <laughs> and I had to kind of back myself away from my computer before I started typing, are you crazy? Have you not heard of skeptical science? I didn't say that, but that was what I was thinking. Luckily, again, social science comes to our rescue. This time it's Dan Cahan's work. Public apathy over climate change is often attributed to a lack of comprehension. The public knows too little science, so let's just educate them. In other words, let's write another report. <laughs> these, were, these were the IPCC reports back in 1990, but they weren't enough, so they wrote a new set from 92 to 94. Those still weren't thick enough. Those volumes were only about this thick. So in 2000, they wrote a new set that were this thick, because clearly that would work. It worked for a while, but then things started to go downhill, so I said, okay, let's write a new set and another one, and then let's go for colored graphics. <laughs> yes. Well, this didn't really turn things around, so maybe it's because these were international reports. What we really need is a national climate assessment, or we need a second one, or we need a third one. Maybe these aren't trusted because they're government reports. Maybe we need a neutral third party like um, the National Academy of Sciences who wrote this one, or wrote also this one, or wrote this one too. Here's the thing though. When we write these letters, like Mark did, we often look at this letter and we think, he wants, he, this was a letter saying, Mr. Bush, we have some people, including me, who can talk to you about climate change. And when you tune into the media, you hear our politicians saying, Oh, we don't know. The science is still out. We're not quite sure. It's too early to do anything. And we think to ourselves, blank slate. They don't know. They need to know. How about they meet with a scientist who can tell them? But I will tell you what I know, and I will tell you what Mark knew when he was writing this letter, and what many of you probably know too. What politicians say in public is radically different than what they say in private. Do you think Jeb Bush, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you think Jeb Bush really doesn't think climate change is real? Where does the man live? Yes. Where I live, we have a congressman who routinely I live in Texas, not Oklahoma, but we still have him in Texas, who routinely stands up in public. And I saw him do this at a meeting of the Society of Environmental Journalists where he was all but heckled out of the room for doing so. Routinely stand up in public and say, we don't know, it's not real, it's too early, why would we do anything about it? And this man was sitting beside one of my colleagues on the way back from a Climate Science Center meeting. And he was talking to my colleague who was from Louisiana, not from Texas, and they got chatting, and he said, where, where were you? And my colleague said, well, we were at a climate science me center meeting. And this congressman said, climate change, that's such an important topic. It represents such a large threat to our country. I'm so glad you're setting it. And my colleague just about choked on his mints. <laughs> but I say this to remind you that the real issue when we go in and we talk to staffers and to congressmen, the real issue is not that they are a blank slate waiting for more information to be written on. The issue is something else, and this is what Dan Cahan's work told us so clearly. He said, we conducted a study to test if it was lack of knowledge, and here's the beauty of science, he said, we found no support for this. In fact, people who with the highest degree of science literacy 
We're the most polarized about climate change. So what's the solution? Lack of education? <laughs> we are not blank slates ready to be written on. Public division over climate change does not stem from lack of information. It stems from personal interests. And that's why what we do here is so important. Because as a scientist, I could write a million peer-reviewed publications, and how much would that sway public opinion? Yes. I, and I have, could invest hours, weeks, months of my time in the next national climate assessment. And that certainly will be used for climate preparedness by many cities, states, and agencies around the country, but how much will it sway public opinion? Yeah, I don't want to listen to that zero over there. I'm hoping it's like 0.1%. <laughs> what will sway people? As a scientist, it hurts me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, it's not the science. What happened to get us in this condition? For me, the light bulb went off when I saw this figure. This is looking at where people were back in 1994. Very centrist, nice normal distributions, nice even distributions, nice symmetrical distributions quite close together. By 2011, we look like this, and by 2014, we look like this. Not only are the middles moving further apart, but we're like scooting away from each other. These are what we call very skewed distributions. There's not a lot of people left in the middle. Everybody's moving to the edges. Why does this matter to climate change? Because just before the last midterm elections, Larry Hamilton at the University of New Hampshire conducted a poll, and his poll was verified by the exit polls from the midterm elections. He asked Democrats and Republicans what they thought of a whole range of social issues. And then he plotted, in order, which issue people were most divided on. Now, the number one issue he found that people were most divided on was the right issue. It was, do you approve of the president? Why are you Democrat or Republican if that isn't what you disagree on? What was the second most polarized issue in the entire United States last year? And it gets even worse. What was number four? Do you trust scientists? <laughs> See, I'm telling you, it's like, not only will science not change people's minds, it can actually move people backwards sometimes, it feels like, from this. I mean, do you see, do you trust your physician on here? Do you trust your accountant? Do you trust your lawn care person? I mean, these are not issues that normally divide people politically. And then, of course, we have the Arctic and weather here, too, nicely rounding out this trio of depression. <laughs> now, some people say, well, it's just those Christians. You know, because we have our politicians constantly invoking God whenever they object to climate change, right? God would not let this happen. The arrogance of humans to assume they can usurp the role of God. God said there will always be seasons. One of my favorite ones, because why do we have seasons? because of the orbit of the Earth around the sun? Are we changing that? No. <laughs> but people will say it. Um, if you're not on my Facebook page already, if you want some entertainment, please join, because every week I get every single religious-based argument about, against climate change on my page. Most of it accompanied by name-calling and profanity, so we do have to delete it pretty quickly. But if you want, so if you want to catch the good ones, you've got to kind of stay, like, stay up on it like this. <laughs> So because of the way people talk about this, invoking God, everything from God designed this planet this way to it will end anyway, so why do we care, we often, create, we often mistakenly assume it's something about Christianity per se that causes people to object to the reality of climate change. And again, social science comes to our rescue. You can tell what I've been reading the last two years. This is from John Evans has said, you know, yes, absolutely, the more conservative you are as a Christian, the less likely you are to think climate change is real. We all know that's true. The polls show us it's true. Here's what he found, though. He found that it was not actually, and I said to him, John, did you really have to say that? You really just meant going to church. You could have said that. <laughs> it's not going to church that makes people object to climate change. It's the older we are and the more politically conservative we are and the further to the right in the Republican Party we are, the more likely we are 
to say it's not real. And there just happens to be an overlap between conservative Christianity and conservative Republicanism, Republicanism going back to the 1980s. Another analysis found that what determines people's opinions on climate change is mostly who we listen to. Elite cues means our thought leaders and what they're saying about the economy. So what are our thought leaders telling us? Well, on CNN in 2013, 30% of what people were telling us was false on CNN about climate change. Why was that? It's because every call I got during 2013 was to debate somebody. And when you debate somebody, you have one head over here and you have the other head over here, right? So what impression does that give? 50-50. So it's no surprise at all that when Ed Maybach from just down here the road at George Mason polled people, Ed found that the average person thinks we're about 50-50 on climate change as a science community. What's the real percentage? 97. If you look at the scientific literature, what's the real percentage? Over 99. Wow, you guys are good. Yes. So what's the real proportions of a debate? Anybody see John Oliver a couple years ago? Yes. He did the 97 to 3, and it didn't really work that well. But that's why whenever I get a call or an invitation to do any type of interview or any type of on-screen discussion about climate change, I've learned to ask. I ask, who else will be on? And what is your message? Because I have looked long and hard at this, and I've thought about this really hard, because people will say, people have said to me, Zondervan, one of the biggest Christian publishers, I think the biggest Christian publisher in North America, was putting out a handbook of religion and science, and they said, we'd like you to write an essay for us on climate change. Having been around the block, I asked, I said, what other essays do you have? And they said, well, we're featuring this one by this guy from a, a free market institute talking about how climate change isn't real. I said... Well, I'm afraid I can't participate then. And then they said, well, don't you feel that people need to know? Don't you want your voice to be heard? Don't you want the truth to be out there? They pulled out all the stops. It was the biggest guilt trip I've ever gotten in my life. And what made it worse was the editor was my dad's friend. They even got my dad involved. And my dad is great on climate change. My dad's a great science educator. My dad's like, you know, they really need to know. But what is that? That's the knowledge deficit model and is also perpetuating the myth that it's 50-50. What did Ed Maybach and his colleagues find? They found that if you have 10 seconds to say one thing to people that will make the biggest difference, what is that one thing you can say? We agree, scientists agree. So I thought long and hard and I eventually decided I felt it was morally wrong for me to engage in a 50-50 debate. because I would essentially be tacitly communicating a lie. Now I've got to give it to the editor. I laid out all my thoughts to him. He argued back and forth with me and he ended up resigning from the book. Yeah. situations where I have been on camera sitting on the interview stage with a microphone already attached right here and they put the last minute script in my lap I hadn't seen before and I saw that they were doing a 50-50 debate and they had not told me and I've stood up taken the microphone off and walked off stage. not to say that we shouldn't stand for the truth. When I get questions, as I frequently do, from people saying, is climate change real? When I get confronted by people who don't think it is, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's in a, a group of people who I often speak to, we have to be prepared to answer. Because it might not matter to that person what we say. Their mind is so firmly made up that not a single piece of information will ever, ever make it past here. 
But there's a lot of other ears listening, and those are the ears to whom we're speaking. Ears that have been stuffed full of false information. I would just like to say that this was an improvement over 2012. In 2012, it was over 90%. Yes, so things are getting better. Things are getting better. We know that the blank slates that people might have started off with decades ago have been written on by very competent hands. And if you have not seen the Merchants of Doubt movie, take yourself to see it. If you are willing to be exceedingly depressed, go ahead and read Jim Hogan's book, Climate Cover-Up, as well. After reading that one Christmas, I nearly quit. It was about a week where I just thought, what am I doing? He's an old PR hand, and he goes through all the tactics that are being used against us. But we're getting smart to that these days. Here's the bottom line. <laughs> these are Australians. They're a little ruder. <laughs> Here's the bottom line, OK? When we write these letters to people, when we meet with people, when we talk to people who say climate isn't changing, it stopped 18 years ago, or 17, or 16, or 15, you know, is how the number always changes, um, or, you know, we're not sure how much is human or it would wreck the economy to do anything about it, what are people really objecting to? They're objecting to the solutions. And what is the power of citizens' climate lobby? We have a solution. That's why this is so important. So when we write these letters, like Mark wrote to Mr. Bush, when we go in to meet with our representatives and their staffers, what is our message? Our message to them is, sure, you may have said some public things about the science that we know are wrong and you know are wrong too. Let's not talk about that. We want to tell you there is a viable solution, a solution with positive impacts on the American economy, the American people, and your district. That is the message that moves people, not five feet worth of IPCC reports. And that is the message that CCL has. So again, it's not about the reports. What's missing is not reports. It's not more scientific data. It's not more scientific studies. I do science because I love it. I love figuring out how something works. That's why we do science. Why do we do CCL? We do it because we know that it's not the science that's missing. It's the political will. And the political will depends on solutions. So what? Can we do about it? What I've learned through the years is really radical for a scientist. I don't start when I'm talking to people with the science. What I start with is I start by talking about what we have in common that we already care about. Because one of the most pervasive myths in our society, aside from the blank slate myth, is the myth that you have to be an ultra-liberal, green tree-hugger who bikes to work, eats granola, does not shower, <laughs> and whose greatest dream is to live off the grid in Colorado or preferably somewhere even more isolated to care about climate change. Now, if you are that person, you probably do care about climate change passionately, and that's great. But for many people, what is holding us back is actually not agreement with the science. It's not acknowledgement that it's a problem. It's the fact that it seems uncomfortable, unnatural, requiring different values than the ones we have right now, requiring us to be a different person than the person we are right now. And if we're past the age of, hmm, who knows what, you know, by the time you have kids and they're this high, they're very formed already. You know, by the time they go to university, you better hope they have all the values they need, otherwise that's kind of the end of that, right? <laughs> I'm not at that point yet. Values are formed very early, and they're an integral part of who we are. So if people think we're asking them to be someone different, how would you like someone asking you to be someone different? 
How would you like somebody suddenly suggesting to you that who you are is not enough, is inadequate? Doesn't feel very good, does it? People generally are happy or comfortable with who they are, and it's important, it's essential <clears throat> on the issue of climate change to let people be who they are and to then connect who they are to climate change. Only at that point do we really want to do any explaining, if at all. But then we have to move on to inspire. How can we work together to fix this problem in a way that is compatible with our values and gives us all a better outcome? So let me talk about this in just a little bit more detail, and then we can get to questions. When we talk to people, they are not all the same. It's not black and white. It's not, and it's not yes, climate change is real, or no, it isn't. Tony Lazarowitz's work has showed us very clearly people are on a continuum. And guess what? The biggest groups of people are cautious and concerned. Now, who's the loudest? Dismissives. So often we, and I mean people who are concerned about climate change as well as we scientists, often we get seduced. We really do. We get intellectually seduced into saying, oh, I can answer their arguments. I have skeptical science app on my phone. <laughs> Hit me with it. I got it. I can give you chapter and verse. I can give you 10 scientific references for every objection you pull out. And we get seduced by that. And I even fall into it myself. I see a Facebook comment and I'm like, oh, I can answer that. It's so easy. But then I answer it and it's like the whack-a-mole game at the carnival. <laughs> it really is. Keep that image in your head. You pull out the hammer, the scientific literature. You pound that mole on the head. And what happens? The next one pops up over here, and it continues infinitely. So if you want to be effective, do not get intellectually seduced by the lure of debating and proving dismissives wrong. There is no point. The way I think of it myself is, if an angel from heaven with tablets of stone appeared in front of them. And in, on those tablets it said in flaming letters, climate change is real, signed God. <laughs> that would not be enough. <laughs> so I often get very well-meaning people saying, if you could just meet with and they name a congressman. If you could just meet with them and tell them, that's not what's going to convince them. I rarely, rarely meet with any type of elected official without a CCLer with me. Why is that? It's because, again, the facts will not convince someone. First of all, our politicians might not be dismissives. They might talk like a dismissive, they might act like a dismissive, they might smell like a dismissive, <laughs> but they are not actually dismissive. In fact, they're probably cautious. They really are. They're smart people. They didn't get to where they're being by being dumb. They're smart. They're savvy. They're probably cautious. But they're cautious both regarding the impacts as well as the economic costs and the political cost of doing something right now. So keep this in mind when you're talking to people. So let's talk about those four points briefly. How can we bond with people? We bond with people over values they already share. Are they fisher? Fishers, like I was. I used to fish from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every morning. Yes. I mostly did catch and release, and honestly, I think I was a source of breakfast for some of those fish. Because by the end, by 10 a.m., I'd be catching fish, and they'd have like four holes down the side. And they'd be like, give me the worm, just give me the worm. <laughs> Are we skiers? My colleague Naomi Oreskes is on the advisory board for Protect Our Winters. Are we parents who care about our kids' health and their future? Do we belong to groups or clubs? Last year, I was invited to give a talk at our Rotary Club in Lubbock. Now, the Rotary Club is mostly, you know, conservative business people. And I knew that, you know, it was going to be a tough crowd, not as tough as the petroleum geologists, but just <laughs> one step down. So I went in, and knowing the Rotary Club, if you know the Rotary Club, they have lunch first. 
Well, lunch saved my rear. <laughs> because during lunch, I was staring at this on the wall, and I was like, is it the truth? Is climate change true? Yes. Is it fair? Heck no. Will it build goodwill to do something about it? Yes, it definitely will. Would it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes. It was like a light bulb went off in my head. So I grabbed my handy laptop from under the, under the table. I did a bit of rearranging of some new title slides in five minutes. I stood up there and I gave the four-way test on climate change. Yes. Yes. And it was awesome. People came up to me afterwards saying, you know, this whole climate change thing, I wasn't really on board, but man, it's the four-way test. How can I say no? <laughs> Bonding is essential because 99.9% .9 of the people on this planet, now this is not an official scientific survey, it's just my guess. I believe that one, every 999 people out of 1,000 people on this planet already have all the values they need to care about climate change already in their heart. I really do. We just need to identify those values many of them faith-based, some of them even place-based. We need to identify those values, and then it's all downhill. We're not pushing a boulder uphill. We're not trying to turn people into tree huggers. We've identified the value. We're already rolling downhill with them. So what do we do once we've identified that value? Then we connect. Given our shared values, how, why, why do I care? Let me share with you, not from my head, let me share with you from my heart why I care. Now, if you're arguing facts, things can get ugly pretty quickly. If somebody is sharing with you from a vulnerable position from their heart, let me share with you why I'm worried, why I'm scared, why I'm concerned. What are you going to do if you don't agree with that person? You're not going to start screaming at them. You'd be the biggest jerk in history. You know, you're probably going to be patting their hand by the end of it. And then you've connected. But you might care too. Why do we care if we're a skier? Rising temperatures threaten our sport. Why do we care if we're a parent? Because climate affects our children and their future. And as parents, we would do anything to ensure a better future for our children. Why do we care about if we care about national security? Because report after report tells us it's a huge threat multiplier to national security. Why do we care about it if we care about the economy? Because Bloomberg and Paulson tell us that it affects our economy. There's real dollars at risk here, and we're headed in the wrong direction. Why do we care about if we live in Texas? Because we either have too much water or not enough water, but never anything in between. And climate change is taking our natural patterns of variability, which in Texas are like this. Here in, in Virginia, they're like this. So in Texas, our natural variability is already like this, and climate change is taking that natural variability and stretching it. That's why we care in Texas. Why do we care if we're Christians? We care because the number one commandment is to love God, and the number two is to love your neighbor. We are told to love others as Christ loved us. And how did Christ love? Sacrificially. Not saying we're equal, but saying I'm putting you above my own life and I'm willing to give my life for your life. And when we look at how, who is impacted by climate change, and this is the effective way to use the science, by the way, when we look at who is impacted, it's in the places where it is not fair. They are not the people who created this problem. And that's why the post encyclical is so important, because it bonds over shared values and it connects those values directly to the issue of climate change. It isn't just the Pope. The National Association of Evangelicals put this report out a couple of years ago, who specifically said that caring for creation is caring for the poor, and that's why we care. Connecting is so important, because those values are already there. They're already there waiting to be tapped. Don't make the mistake of assuming they're not there. Only at this point do we ever want to do any explaining. Sometimes we don't want to do any explaining. But sometimes we want to have just a couple of things at our fingertips in case people ask. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, global warming stopped, you know, 16, no, 17, no, 18 years ago. 
Well, here's how people kind of get global warming stopping, by picking whatever data they like and sort of ignoring the rest of it. Not to mention the fact that this ends before 2014, which was the warmest year on record. And this year is on track to exceed that so far. Explaining that, you know, if it were the sun, we'd be getting cooler. It can't be natural cycles, because our whole planet's warming, not just part of it. It can't be the Earth's orbit, because the next thing that would have been coming was an ice age. We're not still getting warmer after the last ice age. Have that app with you. Don't use it to hammer it people over the head. Don't use it to convince yourself you're going to convince others. But it's always good to have an answer if people ask. Often, though, the explaining takes a different form, explaining why it matters. It matters to us because hurricanes are getting stronger. It matters to us because beetles are eating millions of acres of our forest, putting it at risk for wildfires that are burning larger and larger areas decade after decade. It matters because the ground is crumbling, melting, falling into the ground, taking with it hundreds of Native American villages. It matters because heavy rainfall is increasing around the world, flooding us not just here in Texas, but across the world where people don't have insurance and have even less warning systems than we do, creating a very real toll on human life. This is the type of explaining we can do. And explaining that our choices matter. We have an impact to make now and our choices do make a very real difference. Lastly, though, how can we inspire? We can inspire, again, through solutions that are consistent with our values. We can inspire with values that we all share and we all agree on. If you're talking to anybody of the Christian faith, Catholic or Protestant, we pretty much usually agree on the Bible, even if we try to ignore it sometimes. Inspire people with practical steps they can do. The number one thing I tell anybody who says, what can I do, is I say, get out a carbon calculator, measure your footprint. It's the number one practical thing we can do. And if we do one thing, social science has shown that we feel that we'll do more things after that. So even changing a light bulb, as silly as it seems, is enough to change something up here to make us do more. Not leaving out the fact that if everybody changed one light bulb in every home across America, that would be like taking a million cars off the road. That too. Let's go back to our maps, and this time we do see congressional districts here. Percentage of adults who support regulating carbon as a pollutant, it's all orange. Do you see that? That's good news. Like 70 to 80% of all Americans support regulating carbon as a pollutant. Who supports a carbon tax? Well, guess what? It's around 40 to 45% of people. And hey, in South Texas, we're looking really good. Who are the CCLers in South Texas? Whoever you are. <laughs> there's movement, there's momentum. 40% of people across the US, more or less depending on what state you're in, support a carbon tax, which is what you're proposing. Inspire with progress already made. Guess what? British Columbia's had a carbon tax. What's the shocking truth about it? It built their economy. They have the lowest personal income tax rate in Canada. And if you've ever paid taxes in Canada, that's a big deal. Oh my goodness, tax day in Canada. It's a sad, sad day. They have one of the lowest corporate rates in all of North America. Who knew? With a carbon tax, it can be done. It's real. It works. We can inspire with the fact that Texas is breaking records in wind power generation. Last spring, Texas generated over 30% of its electricity from wind for a given week. That's amazing. Yeah. The area of Texas that it would take, if you covered it in solar panels, to supply electricity to the entire United States, with all those handy battery packs that Elon Musk has invented, of course. <laughs> the area of Texas is a small square, about 10,000 square miles, that would fit between Plainview and Amarillo, if anybody knows where that is. Trust me, it's not land that would be missed. <laughs> there, I can say that. <laughs> Inspire with visionary technology. Who doesn't want a solar bike path? Who doesn't want a battery pack in their home so they can generate their own electricity? Who doesn't want solar shingles or a home that you, know, you don't have to be hooked up to the grid for if you could make your own electricity? Who doesn't want a car that you just plug in and drive? We all want cool stuff. 
Who these days, who has one of those old clunky cell phones like this big? <laughs> with those antenna, those rubber antenna, who has one of those? Everybody has the new technology. Why do we have the new technology? Is it because somebody said we should get it? Is it because somebody said we ought to get it? It's because it's cool and it's fun and everybody wants it and it works better than what we have. Energy is the same way and we can get there. And lastly, we can inspire with meaningful action and that is why what CCL does is so important. Social science has shown, and this is my last little tidbit for you here, social science has shown that if we talk to people about a problem, but we don't offer a solution to that problem that they can immediately engage in, that our, as humans, our acceptance of that problem is radically lower than if we just have a simple solution that we can do. So Citizens Climate Lobby offers people a solution. It offers people something that we as individuals can do. And that is essential to convincing people, not just that there's a real problem, but that we can actually do something and we can create the political will to fix it. That's the only reason why we have hope. <laughs> if you haven't seen this cartoon already, and I know many of you have, this is a keeper. What would we do if it's all a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> so just to summarize, the next time you talk to somebody, look at that person and say to yourself, I know they have all the values in their heart they need to care about this issue, just like I do. I just need to find out what value it is that I can connect most effectively on a, in a real way. Now that's essential because, speaking up in Canada, I had um, a scientist come up to me after my talk at a Christian college and say, I love what you do and I really want to do what you do, but I have no success. I've been trying to reach out to all these churches in the conservative inner valley in British Columbia and I just can't get a foothold. I really want to go speak to churches. So I said to him, well, what denomination do you attend? You know, thinking you've got to bond over your shared values. He said, oh, I'm an atheist. <laughs> I said, forget the churches. You've got to bond over a genuine shared value, not make one up. But we can do that. So remember to connect bond. And then connect what you have bonded over to climate. Only then, if you have to do any explaining of what you think they need to know, but then inspire the solution. And again, that's what CCL does. Because it isn't fear that's going to move us forward. Fear paralyzes. We have a knee-jerk reaction, and then we freeze. It isn't guilt. Guilt gives like a little bit of, oh, I'll do something to feel less guilty, but then I'm done. Fear and guilt hold us back. They prevent us from moving forward. What moves us forward, as Marshall said, is love for others, love for our communities, for our families, for the places where we live, and for our neighbors on the other side of the world. And what also moves us forward is hope. So I'm going to close with a quote from one of my favorite scientists, Jane Goodall. When she was told, you really shouldn't be naming your chimpanzees. That is an unsciencey thing to do, young lady. <laughs> she responded with this she said it is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential so that's why we need to move forward not just with what's up here but with what's in here and with an unwavering sense of hope for the future thank you